How's it going, folks? I'm Brother Matthew, and welcome to Christian Coffee Time, where we sit down together to study the Word of God. And today we're going to continue on our study of the book of Acts. We're up to Acts chapter 3. So I hope that you'll join in. So please grab your Bibles, notepads, and pens, and be ready to study the Word of God. Grab your tea, grab your coffee as well, as this is Christian Coffee Time. You got, Of course, you got to have your tea and coffee. So, All right, so... Um, with this, uh, we're going to be, again, using the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study, which are a what? What are the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study? Some of you should know this by now. What are they? The three points of the Christian faith, three points of Bible study. This is the Berean method, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. The Bereans are more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. So when you break that down, what does it what what does it show? What are the three points? Three points of Bible study, three points of the Christian faith. <clears throat> Give it a few more seconds. The three points of the Christian faith. The three points of Bible study that we use, and again, we have them on our bookmarks. You can get them on the uh, hashtag Christian Coffee Time Etsy store. It is interpretation, application, and demonstration. Interpretation, application, and demonstration. Now, to understand what these three points are, interpretation is the what. The what of the narrative. What is it specifically saying? The narrative of the text. So you don't cherry pick a single point, a single verse out. You leave it in and you read the whole context, the whole narrative. So you, you get an idea of the, of the full meaning. So it's avoiding cherry picking the what. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. So again, interpretation, the what. Now, interpretation, there's only one. There is only one interpretation of the Word of God. There aren't multiple interpretations. What it says is what it means, whether you like it or not. Now this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. Knowing this first, so first and foremost, before everything else, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. For the scriptures came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. So, we see interpretation. There's only one, knowing this first. No prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. It's not open to what I think, what I feel, what, what I guess about it, what it says, what it means. Now, so we see now that there's only one interpretation the what of the context, the what of the narrative. Then we go to the second point, which is application. Now, there's only one interpretation. There are many applications. It can be applied mentally, physically, spiritually, circumstantially. It can be applied to multiple scenarios. But again, what it says is what it means. So you've got to learn right application. So there's one interpretation, then you've got to discern right application. Now, it can be applied, but again, you make sure you don't cherry-pick it to apply it. you got to use the full context. Now, application is the how. How is it specifically being said? The specific words and the pictures and the images, the word meanings, and all of that kind of stuff, and the word meanings. So this is where you dive deeper. You back up, slow down, go again through it slowly, get an idea of the full meaning. So you do the word studies and then the cross-referencing. How can I pair with what I'm reading with other aspects of the Word of God? Like, for example, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, you know Psalm 23 fairly well. You should. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, where else... In the Word of God, does it talk about God being our shepherd? Well, for example, you could go to uh, John chapter 10. 
Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And I give my life for my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me and I give unto them eternal life. In Ezekiel, God says over a dozen times, my flock, my sheep, my sheep, my flock. And it keeps going on, and I will feed them. I will guard them. So you see, if you cross-reference that scripture, you see God continuously saying how he's our shepherd. Jesus says this as showing, again, his divinity. You also cross-reference, like for example, in um, James chapter 2. Faith that works is dead. The holy grail, golden calf of the works-based salvationists. But if you take James chapter 2, faith that works is dead, cross-reference that with the Pauline epistles, you then, by using the clear to interpret the unclear, you see that James is not talking about salvation. Paul is, James is not. James is talking about proliferation of the faith, otherwise it would contradict. So you cross-reference for the purpose to understand right discernment and right Bible study. Okay, so we see one interpretation multiple applications, and then you see interpretation, application, demonstration. Demonstration of the word. Now, what is this? Go. Speak it, think it, live it, do it. Now, go show it. So, you, you read it, you study it, you apply it to yourself, and then go do it. This is the Berean method. A personal application, personal study, personal proper reading. This is the three points of the Christian faith, the three points of Bible study, uh, this is what is it's interpretation, application, demonstration, the what, the how, and the why. If you have any questions on that, please go ahead, ask away. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All right, with that as our intro, we're going to dive into this now. Um, we're going to be taking a look at Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> so please grab your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 3. And we're going to go just verse by verse, point by point. And if you have any comments, questions, issues, insights regarding the study at hand, by all means, go ahead, ask away. If it's not relating to the topic at hand, if you could just hold that to the end of the study, I want to try to reduce the amount of rabbit trailing that we could get on. <laughs> I want to try to stay on point on, on topic here. It's a little difficult sometimes, but i got to try. <clears throat> All right. Acts chapter 3. Oh, and before I forget, uh, I just need to make a quick mention. We're about to get hit with a severe, severe winter storm. Um, the power could easily go out uh, over the next few days. Um, yes, I'm reading from King James. If for some reason I'm I'm just kind of absent on social media, it's because the power went out. So just keep that in mind. Um, this be, if you could be praying that our power would not go out, that would be great. And, uh, and yeah, so I just want to let you know, just in case something comes up and something happens like that. So but anyways, let's get back to this already rabbit trailed Acts chapter three. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. All right. <clears throat> so like the song, Peter and John went to pray, they met a lame man on the way. Okay. So we see Peter and John, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, are going up to the temple, they're going up there to pray, and... As they're climbing the steps, they see a guy there who's been lame since birth. Now, is it just coincidence that this happened to work out this way? Is it just coincidence that this man was lame there like this? You see, a lot of people, they see this and they only look at the surface point. But what I like to do is I like to 
re-engineer it. Because I personally do not believe in coincidences, chance, or luck. I don't believe in them. There's no such thing as coincidence, chance, and luck. Now, if you take a look at what happened, skipping ahead, we see, we see the lame man is healed, and this opens up a massive preaching opportunity for the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John. We, there, we then, therefore, cannot say that this was chance or luck, because this is direct orchestration of God. God worked it out. That this man was there, lame, for so long. Now, why is that a big thing? Because all the people knew him, as it says. All the people knew him. They knew this guy. He was there every day for years and years and years. Sitting there, begging. Why is that a big deal? Let's keep reading. Peter and John went to pray, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb. Now, see there, that, that also will refute any possible complaints or trolls that could say that, well, this is just a setup. We don't know who he was. He he could he could have been perfectly fine. He's just he was just pretending so that the apostles uh, could make it look like they did some big thing. No, see the thing is everybody knew him. He'd been lame all his life. Everybody knew who he was. He'd been begging there in a very open public area. Do you see this? He would he would had to be carried to this spot at the temple where he would beg for money, whom they laid daily at the, at the gate of the temple. This gate was called the beautiful gate. He sat at the beautiful gate of the temple to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So his, so his livelihood, what he would do is he'd sit there and as people are coming in, coming in, he would ask alms and people would toss him a coin or something to help him out. And this is kind of ritual tradition it got it became because he was always there and everybody saw him he became a a daily sight everybody saw him they're very familiar with him they knew him very well so as he's sitting there begging peter and john verse three who seeing peter and john about to go into the temple asked an alms an alms so peter and john come along coincidence Chance? Luck? No. Direct orchestration of God. God worked it out so that this guy would be well known. For what purpose? We'll get to that. Is that he was born lame. Now some people say that's not fair. From our perspective. But what about God? What about that this man was made by God to be lame so that at this point, with Peter and John, at a massive preaching opportunity where tons and tons and tons and tons of people would get saved. And the lame man would be healed and saved. Think about it. From God's perspective, can we say anything negative about the lame man? About him being born lame? Or was that actually, from God's perspective, a good thing looking at the future perspective? Think about it. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. So Peter and John, Peter and John, they are walking up and the guy asks an alms and Peter stops. Now we see that Peter, sorry, what? If he hadn't been lame, he may never have experienced this and would not have gotten saved. Exactly. Exactly. So Peter and John, as they're going by, now they don't treat this flippantly. They don't treat this flippantly. They're not pa passing by and he doesn't just, you know, say a word and keep going. No, he stops and fastens his whole attention. Just like Jesus did. Whenever someone asked an alms of Jesus, a help, 
of prayer, advice of Jesus. Jesus would give his whole attention. He would never divide his attention. He would, he would put his whole attention on the person, showing respect as well. Peter, following the example of Jesus, stops. Whenever someone called upon Jesus, Jesus would stop and pay attention. Peter did the same thing. Peter stopped and gave his full attention to the guy and got the guy's full attention. Peter says, look on us. Because the lame man, of course, they see all the people going by, would ask Peter and then would be asking others and asking them. And Peter says, look at us. So the guy stopped and gave his full attention to Peter and John. Peter didn't try to talk to the guy while the guy was off over here and over here and, you know, and talking to other people. And he, he, got, he put his whole attention on the guy and he got the guy's whole attention. Because what he was about to say had to be very clear. He had to get the message across in absolute clarity. Peter says, look on us. Verse 5. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. So the guy's now full attention is on Peter and John, expecting like maybe some big monetary gift or something, or some other thing. And Peter says... <laughs> Peter says the prosperity gospel preacher's worst nightmare. Peter says, silver and gold have I none. Now look at that. Silver and gold have I none. What does that statement also give across? Literally nothing of their ability. Nothing of them. Peter and John are just men. They are not gods. They're, they don't have magic powers. They have nothing. It's not in their name. They don't even have any money. <laughs> They're destitute. Nothing. They've got nothing but faith. Faith. By faith they spoke. By faith they preached. Silver, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. What does he have? Such as I have, and I have in great abundance. He fills us up. He fills us with his spirit. But such as I have, I have faith in the Lord. Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. And he's sharing it now. This faith is not something that's to be kept a secret. It's not hell's best kept secret. It's to be shared openly, publicly. Shared amongst family and friends and strangers. Go out there and share it around. Share the abundance. Your cup overflows. Fill up other people's cups with the joy of the Lord and the power of Christ. But such as I have, give I thee. I'm going to give you. Such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up. And walk. I'm going to give you the power of Jesus Christ that he gave me. It's not my power. It's not my ability. I'm sharing Christ. How can I share Christ like that? By faith. If Jesus was to stand in front of the lame man, would Jesus be able to heal the man? Well, yeah, Jesus is God. Jesus says, go in my name and heal the sick and cast out devils and preach the gospel. So when you speak the name of Jesus in power and faith, Jesus is standing with you. His spirit is sealing you. You're not Jesus. We're not gods. We are ambassadors of him, representatives of him. That when we speak his name and the power of his name, 
He's the one speaking. The Spirit of God says, I will give you the words with which to say in the very same hour. So it's the Spirit of God speaking through us. It's the power of God working through us. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ being taught by inspiration and understanding of the Spirit of God through us. As Jesus would, would speak, so we speak in his name. So it's not Peter's power, it's Christ's power that he's sharing to the lame man. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I have, I have. It's not a question. 1 John 5.13 1 John 5.13 That ye may know that ye have eternal life. I have faith. I have Christ. I have authority. I have the power of the name of Jesus Christ. I have this. It's an absolute adamant thing. There's no question, no doubt, no worry no shadow of doubt. I have this. And nothing can remove this from me. I share this. Such as I have. You see the words. You see the words. You pay attention to the specific words. I have. So because I have this. I have a cup of coffee. I have this. I can share this. I have the word of God. I share it. I have faith in Christ. I share it. I have something in my possession that I am not meant to hoard and just keep to myself. I share it. Share with all, expecting nothing in return, as Christ says. We share it. We share the faith. Witnessing. You can share the faith in many ways. Share the faith by handing out gospel tracts. Go out in the street re and preach or preach the word of God. You could just open your Bible, start reading it out loud in the street. Share the faith. Share it to the needy. Share it to those that, that, that need to hear it. Help the sick. Help the poor. Help, help the widows. and Help the lost. Help them all. All those that you have ability to speak to, speak to them in power. It's not your words. It's Christ's, such as I have. I have this. I have faith in Christ. And nothing, nothing can destroy it. There's no devil of hell that can take it away. Get assaulted for that nowadays. No, I know. Because they hate Jesus Christ. But should that stop us? <laughs> no. For so they persecuted the prophets and the apostles. So they persecuted Christ. We're just joining the ranks of those persecuted. It's a holy order. So such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name, by the power of his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, believe on the name of Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe in the name of Jesus Christ and he will answer your prayers. Believe in the name of Jesus Christ and he will help you and strengthen you and guide you. Believe on the name of Jesus Christ and he will heal you and help you and provide for you. In the name of Jesus Christ of, Ra of Nazareth, rise up and walk. See, we are meant to follow Christ. It's not just believe in Jesus and then sit down, do nothing, don't witness, don't do anything for him and just keep it to yourself and hide. It's not believe in the name of Jesus and sit down. There are no sideliners. There are no bench warmers. We're all meant to be out in the field being busy. All men, women, and children who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are meant to speak the gospel. Go out and show Christ. Rise up. Walk. Go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now, again, use your sanctified imagination just for a moment. All right? Use your sanctified imagination. This guy, all his life, was sitting there, a man. So he'd gone all his life. He's now an adult. His entire life, he was born lame. 
So I'd like you to picture just for a moment, picture this scene. Picture the Temple of Solomon. Now picture Peter and John standing there. And in front of them, sitting on the ground, was a lame man. His entire life born lame. His legs would be complete atrophied. They just looked like bones covered with skin. Zero muscle mass. Complete atrophied on his legs. He had never used them his whole life. He wasn't able to. Peter says, rise up and walk. Now stand there just for a moment. Stand with Peter and look at this scene. From our perspective, that is utterly impossible. That is ridiculous. That's, it's, it's, it's not possible. Scientifically, medically, everything. It's completely, utterly impossible. A lame man can't walk. Why are you telling him to rise up and walk? You're, you're dashing his hopes. You're hurting the guy. See, this is the mindset of modern Christianity. They have zero faith. Peter and John say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He reaches down and grabs him by the right hand and pulls. He goes to stand him up. The guy, does he just kind of just go, you know, like like a sleeping cat? <laughs> just go limp and just, and Peter's trying to, trying to, you know, fight him to stand him up? No, no, no. Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And what does it say? Immediately. His feet and ankle bones received strength. Received. Received. Strength. What does that say? Supernatural power. Because of the faith of Peter, go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 15. James chapter 5, verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick. You see, the, the lame man was an unbeliever. The lame man was a beggar, lame from since birth. It was Peter's faith, John's faith, that the Lord rewarded. Peter spoke in faith believing, proclaimed in faith believing. He declared the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Lord rewarded their faith. They asked in faith believing. That's why the guy received strength. The guy was just listening to Peter. But So why? what did Peter do this for? What was the reason of this? What was the reason for the healing? So he could receive money? <laughs> no. So he could receive fame and fortune and build up his name and show how powerful he is. He's a healer. <laughs> no. Peter is no healer. He's not a healer. You hear some people say, I have the spiritual gift of healing. I'm meant to be a healer. Uh, Peter is an apostle, a preacher of the gospel, is that the Spirit of God worked through him in healing and preaching and helping and many other things. The gift of faith that the Lord rewards 
is in the, is upon all saints. Every single born again Christian can ask in faith, believing, can go and share the gospel, proclaim the gospel, preach the gospel, uh, pray in intercession and help the poor and help in charity, help in service, and even pray over the sick and those that, that are need for healing. Any Christian can do that. It's the same, same gifts by the same spirit, the self-same spirit. All are all have the same spirit. All can do this. It's not that, well, he has the, he, only he can do that. Only they can do that. Oh, no. If you believe in the Lord God, Jesus Christ, it's his spirit that seals all saints, that works through all saints. The same gifts come from the self-same spirit. You see what I mean? Now look at, look at this. And immediately his feet and ankle bones receive strength. Immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. It wasn't some long, drawn-out process. It was immediate. When the Lord does something, he does it immediately. Verse 8. And he leaping up. He leaping up. He goes from being a completely lame atrophied individual just laying on the ground can't even move Peter reaches down takes his right hand and the guy jumps up that's how fast the Lord came upon him that's how fast the Lord is able to work now the reason why I'm really emphasizing this is because we have a tendency nowadays, when we look at the miracles of the, in the Bible, we see them as, well, that was then, this is now. That somehow, because we have technology, miracles are no longer possible. Because that we are somehow an advanced society, these kinds of things can't happen. Well, we just haven't seen it happen. Hmm, I wonder why. It's because we don't really see people with the same kind of faith that Peter and John had. You see, the Lord rewards faith. Well, I know, but I don't know if I have faith that, you know, size of grain of mustard seed. If I had that, I can move mountains. Well, did you not have faith the size of a mountain when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you not have faith the size of a mountain when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, we get so overcome by looking at the mustard seed, we forget the mountain. You had faith the size of the universe when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. You believed by blind faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you believe by blind faith in the rest of the story? That the Lord is able. The same God that parted the sea and raised the dead, that created the universe, that brought down the fire for Elijah, that did all the miracles throughout the scriptures, raising the dead, healed the sick, and walking on water, feeding the thousands, parting the sea, knocked down the wall, and all the different stuff that, that happened throughout the word of God. Same God, same power, same ability. As he was with Moses, as he was with Elijah, as he was with Daniel, as he was with David, as he was with Jonah, as he was with the disciples, so he is with us. So he is with us. If my friend Pam is still in the audience, she knows full well about the healing power of God. Absolute, miraculous healing. The Lord is able the Lord is able. The Lord works through wondrous ways. Wondrous ways. He is still able. He can heal those who believe. Those who have faith. As we see, the man immediately jumped up. What does that show? He believed Peter. He believed Peter. 
when he heard Peter say the name of Jesus Christ, a fire went through his bones. He knew that name. He knew that name. All Israel knew that name. Where Jesus, throughout his ministry, Jesus went from town to town, to city to city, from place to place. Thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of thousands of people everywhere. Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead, healing the lepers, healing the blind, uh, helping the poor, feeding the thousands, walking on the water, doing all this stuff, and debating against the, the, the Sanhedrin. That Everybody in Israel knew Jesus. They knew the name Jesus. This guy knew who Jesus was. He had no idea who Peter and John was, but he knew who Jesus was. The strangers have no idea who we are. The world has no idea who we are. Jesus I know, Paul I know. Who are you? See, all, all people knew Paul because Paul was, a, was a, such a public individual. Everybody knew Paul. And the devils knew Paul because Paul brought Christ. They don't have to know who you are. We're a nobody. But we are representatives ambassadors, the proclaimers, we're the town criers. They know who Jesus is. All the world knows who Jesus is. You go out in the street corner, start preaching Buddha. No one will care. Start preaching Hinduism or Islam. No one will care. Start screaming off the satanic Bible. No one will care. Start preaching Jesus. Watch what happens. It's like kicking a hornet's nest. I got banned on Instagram again for three days <laughs> for posting Bible verses of the gospel, of just how to be saved, just the gospel on some witchcraft posts. So I got banned for three days. I can't post for three days. They know who Jesus is. They get mad. The world gets mad, viciously mad when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They know full well who Jesus is. This lame man knew full well who Jesus was. He knew that the name of Jesus had power. He knew that the name of Jesus could heal the sick, could heal the lame, could raise the dead. He knew that the name of Jesus could feed the thousands. He knew that Jesus could turn water to wine. He, he, he heard the stories of how Jesus raised the dead, how Jesus brought Lazarus from the grave, how, how Jesus put his hands upon the blind man, restored their sight, how Jesus healed the lepers. He heard the stories how Jesus healed the, the, the man with the withered hand, the woman with, with, the, with the, the blood issue. He healed them all. That Jesus is able. We are not. Jesus is. In the name of Jesus Rise up and walk. And he leaping up because he knew Jesus is able. Jesus is able. I'm not. You're not. He is. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, why do you use that name? Full identity. Jesus, the Christ from Nazareth. He, wrote, he grew up. He grew up in Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth. It's all the people so they would know full well who he was talking about. There was no question. Not in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Which Jesus? Because Jesus is a name that there were many other people back then who actually had the name of Jesus. It was a Hebrew name. Which Jesus are we preaching? The Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses? The Jesus of the Mormons? The Jesus of the Muslims? The Jesus of the Hindus? The Jesus of... Which Jesus? Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. The Lord God, Jesus Christ. The Lord God, 
Jesus Christ is who I preach. That's why I say that. You hear me say that all the time. I don't just say Jesus Christ. I say the Lord God Jesus Christ. Because that automatically refutes every single other belief system in the world. Because the Jesus, according to the word of God, is God manifested in the flesh. This Lord Jesus. This Lord Jesus. And immediately, his feet and ankle bones receive strength. And he, leaping up, stood. He stood and walked. And entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. You can see this in our, it's a big scene. He just caused a huge scene. This is supposed to be a somber, quiet worship place. Everyone's really quiet, walking around, praying, and the sacrifices, and the incense, and doing their, their things in the worship, and the reading, and, and all this at, at the holy temple. And here comes Peter and John through the, through the door, and this, this guy jumping up and down, jumping up and down, and shouting, praise the Lord, and a huge scene. And all the people come gathering around. Huge, huge scene. And all the people saw him and walking and praising God. He's shouting and singing up a storm. And they knew it was he which sat at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. Now we see the whole reason. The orchestration of God. God caused this man to be born lame for the future purpose of a mighty declaration of the power of God, proving God lives, God reigns, and there's power and life and healing in the name of Jesus Christ. That was the whole purpose. God who sees all things, knows all things, he saw this, he planned this, God planned this. He planned for that guy to be born lame so that he would be walking and leaping and praising God in the temple, proving that God reigns, God is sovereign, and there's power and life and healing in the name of Jesus Christ. For the purpose, so Peter would have a, a obvious, clear, public proof and declaration of Jesus Christ whom he preaches. That it's not just words, it's not just philosophies, it's not metaphors and allegories, it's not, it's not moral platitudes, it's not just opinions, it's obvious and proof there's power in this. That's why you heal. That's why you preach. That's why we do what we do, to prove Jesus Christ. It's not just words. It's not just philosophies. It's not just opinion. Jesus Christ is Lord. And all eyes will see him. All knees will bow to him. All tongues will confess to him that Jesus Christ is Lord. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Prove it. The Lord working with them. Confirming the word with signs following. Mark 16 verse 20. And they, preaching everywhere the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Lord working with them, the Lord confirming the word, the Lord doing the signs and wonders, proving the words that they say. Proving the words that they say. <laughs> so, we see, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power. It's not just words. It's not just a battle of knowledge. It's not just a knowledge war. The cessationists are completely wrong. Completely off the mark. It's not just words. It's not just books. It's not just books. This one is alive. These words have power. When these words are spoken, it has an effect. 
It changes the hearts. It changes the minds. It heals the soul. It opens the eyes. It even heals the body. It provides for the needs. It shows the promises. And when you believe these words, it actually has an effect. These words part the sea. These words knock down the wall. These words fell the giant. These words heal the sick. And all the people saw him. It's not something that's to be done in secret. The Christians that refuse to speak up. They are following what's called hell's best kept secret. Hell's best kept secret is the gospel that's refused to be spoken. We need to speak the words, prove the words, show them in faith, believing, show them there's life in his name. There's power in his name. The devils are subjected to it. The cults have no power over it. All the people saw it speak the gospel publicly. The prophets. Here's, here's the one thing I love. The prophets were street preachers. Think about it. All the prophets are street preachers. Jesus was a street preacher. The disciples were street preachers, not building hiders. All the saints of God of time past, all the servants of God of time past were street preachers, not building hiders. They did everything outwardly, publicly. They showed it and spoke it in faith, believing. If you cannot speak up about Christ publicly, how can you say you're a disciple of Christ? Think about that one for a moment. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You also have social media. Social media evangelism. Do you preach Christ on social media? Think about it. <clears throat> All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew. Now see, here's the point. You see, this is the plan of God. They knew it was him which sat at the gate. And they knew who he was. He'd been there all his life, sitting in the same spot, begging the same alms, in the same shape his whole life. Atrophied legs, because he can't walk, he had to be carried. They knew who he was, they knew him by name, they knew his face, they knew all about it, they knew. So when they saw him walking and leaping and praising God, they knew something supernatural had just taken place. Without question. No question. They had just saw him like a few minutes earlier. They passed him on the steps. He was lame with atrophied legs. Now here he comes, walking and leaping, jumping up and down, proving he wasn't just being carried by Peter and John like some sleight of hand trick. He was walking, he was walking, he was leaping and praising God. Proving it was no trick. It was supernatural. Defies the laws of physics. Defies all medical science. Defies all the laws of nature. It defies all reason. It defies all logic. It defies everything of the known universe. It's not possible but that's why i love god because he does that which is impossible it's not possible to raise the dead it's not possible to part the sea 
It's not possible that hail falls from the sky and burns as fire on the ground. It's not possible that fire falls out of the sky at the asking pleading of Elijah on Mount Carmel. It's not possible to walk on the water. It's not possible to, for just a couple loaves and a couple fish to feed thousands so that there's 12 baskets full afterwards. It's not possible to turn water into wine. It's not possible to make the lame walk, the blind see, the mute talk, the, the, the cripples to, to walk. It's not possible to do the things that Scripture says. That's because with men it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? God loves to blow our minds. And you just stand back in awe and wonder and just say, Wow. He did it again. He said he would. I asked. I waited. There he goes. Did it again. Lord, there's another sea here. There's another wall here. There's another Goliath here. There's another Leviathan over here. There's another need over here. Lord, thou art able. Thou art able. And we ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. The Lord says, though, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And if you had faith, you could say unto this tree, be plucked up by the roots and be planted in the waters, and it would do it. You could say unto this mountain, be thou moved, and it would do it. The impossible becomes possible when you believe. When you truly, truly believe in the Lord, in the power of His might, when you truly, truly, truly believe in the name of Jesus Christ, the impossible becomes possible because He is able to do it. Not me. When I see that it's physically impossible, that's when He does the supernatural. That's when he does the supernatural. 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 Beyond the natural. And he walking and leaping and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of healing. That's the whole point of doing this. Not for my, my own name, my own power to declare myself, to make myself some big one or some stupid thing or to get money and rich and to, to bolster my abilities. Or whatever. No, it's nothing of me. I don't want the attention on me. Just as Peter says. What does he say? And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at us? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? As though by our own power of holiness, we had made this man to walk. It's nothing of me. I don't do it for me. I don't do it for anything of me. I do it for Jesus Christ. Because it opens a door of utterance. Because the people see that there's hope. That there's truth in this. It's not just allegories and philosophies. It's not metaphors. It's not platitudes. It's not opinions. It's not, it's not personal ideologies. It's the truth. When you speak the true Lord Jesus Christ, things happen. The sick are healed. The lame can walk. The dead are raised. Souls are saved. They were filled with wonder and amazement. What did that wonder and amazement do? It caused them to listen to Peter when Peter told them how it was done in the name of Jesus Christ. And he preached unto them Christ. Healings are done for preaching opportunities. To declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. To help the saints be excited and strengthened in the name of Jesus Christ. To raise the dead men and to raise the dead souls and to raise the dead faith. That's the whole point. 
That when people see this, when it happens, what happens? They become completely overwhelmed in love of Jesus Christ. Their faith is built up again. You just brought back a dead fire. You just raised a dead soul. They believed in Jesus Christ. The unsaved got saved. The saved got encouraged. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. And the, as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John. He was just hugging them. Big old bear hugs. Jumping up and down and shouting praise to the Lord. And hugging up. You can see Peter and John just grinning from ear to ear. They seriously, when you're around someone who's that excited, you can't not smile. I mean, the most cold-hearted, horse-faced individual can't, can't help but grin. When someone is that Truly, sincerely excited, you can't not smile. He's jumping up and down and shouting, praising God. And all the people are just laughing. They're laughing at this, at his excitement. Pure excitement. Holy excitement, a holy joy. He holding on to Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch. It's called Solomon, Solomon's porch. Greatly wondering, in Solomon's porch... Why is that it? Why is that a thing? Why did it say that? Where was Jesus always preaching? When Jesus walked the earth and he would go to the synagogues and, and he would go and preach and then he'd go to the temple. When Jesus would go to the temple, where would Jesus always go in the temple? What was his his preaching platform the spot where he would always preach and teach solomon's porch jesus always taught in solomon's porch we're at verse 11 verse 11 so peter and john apostles of jesus christ just caused this lame man to be healed and then what did they do they went and stood in the same place that Jesus stood and taught the same message that Jesus taught to cause the people to see and hear and understand the same thing that Jesus had been telling them. The same message, the same gospel, the same power of the same spirit in the same spot, in the same way. Why is that important? Today, the born-again Christians of the same name, of the same spirit, of the same message, preach in the same way, in the same place, in the same scriptures, just like they did. God does not change. His power doesn't change. His spirit doesn't change. His name doesn't change. His word doesn't change. His promises doesn't change. His gospel doesn't change. We preach the same gospel that the disciples in the early church preached. Of the same power that they had. Of the same spirit they had. Because it's of God. It's of the one true God. And when Peter saw it, that all the people were running together into Solomon's porch, just like they did to Jesus, what did he do? Now, Peter, there's a, I'm, not, I'm not saying he was tempted. I'm just using this as an example of something. There could have been a temptation. Because the devil kind of works the same way, too. Where he could have, I'm not saying he did, he could have built up his own name. He had a whole platform here. Something mighty just happened. He could have built up his own name. But what did he do? What did he do that's completely, utterly the opposite of what you see a lot of people doing today? Building up their own name. 
the prosperity preachers, the self-professed so-called prophets and prophetesses and apostles, and all these other people building up their own names. What did Peter do? When Peter saw it, he answered and said unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power holiness we had made this man to walk? He lowered himself. He completely brushed aside all the attention off of him. It's not of me. It's not my ability. I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with this. Why are you looking at us? I didn't do it. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, Jesus. He took the opportunity to preach to them, Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord God Jesus Christ. Of the promise of the prophets. That the one that would come. Born of a virgin. Born in Bethlehem. Called the mighty God. Who be put to death for our sins. And be resurrected. This same Jesus. That stood here. A while ago. Stood in, the, in Solomon's porch. Preaching and teaching. This same Jesus that fulfilled the prophecies of the prophets. This same Jesus that was crucified, buried, and rose again. This same Jesus whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. We are witnesses. We're all witnesses. We are all witnesses of the power of God. We're all witnesses of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We are all witnesses of the power of His name and the Spirit of Christ. We're witnesses of the power of the gospel. Witnesses. Testifiers. And His name through faith in His name. See that? Verse 16. And His name Jesus Christ, and His name, through faith in His name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by Him hath given Him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Perfect soundness. Soundness of mind, legion, the demoniac, was found healed, clothed, sitting in his right mind. The Spirit of Jesus Christ, through the gospel, brings soundness of mind, understanding, clarity, power. It, it brings healing, healing of soul and body. It brings understanding. The gospel of Jesus Christ is of such infinite power. It illuminates the eyes and the mind to the truth. And his name, through faith in his name, all things are possible. Look at what the apostles did in his name. Look what the early church did in his name. Look what happened to you in his name. Look what the Lord has done for you. I would like you to take a moment. Just take a moment. I would like you to think back to the moment you got saved and think of every single answer of prayer, provision, help, guidance, wisdom, everything that the Lord has ever given you since then. Think of every single thing the Lord has done. From the moment He saved your soul, the moment He helped you and protected you and provided for you and guided you, granted you wisdom and understanding and instruction. By His name, through faith in His name, you're here today. By His name, through faith in His name, you have been made a witness. I have made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith 
which is by him, hath given him this perfect soundness in, uh, soundness in the presence of you all. Right, Pam? <laughs> by faith in his name, through the power of his name. Perfect soundness. You see, the Lord is able... The Lord is able. A great mighty healing was done in the name of Jesus Christ upon our friend Pam. I'll leave it to her if she wants to share it. Completely racked with all kinds of issues and problems and pains and ailments. It just supernatural. Within an hour, just boom. The Lord completely healed. Full body healing. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. By his name, through faith in his name. Perfect soundness. Perfect soundness. There's that word again. Perfect. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished all good works. Perfect power. Perfect soundness. Perfect understanding. Perfect salvation. A perfect hope. You can hope upon him perfectly without a single shadow of a doubt. No worry, no fretting, no fearing. Nothing you have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes, a good friend Pam here. And, uh, had a lot of uh, problems, a lot of ailments, illnesses, uh, uh, body pains. She could barely walk, could barely move. So many pains, uh, just in such absolute pain. We have been doing some Bible studies and, and some Bible counseling. And I, and then I, I showed her what the gospel says. I showed her what the word of God says about trusting in his name for all things, for help, for guidance, for healing and provision. And I, I showed her the faith of Jesus Christ. We finish up the finish up the, the Bible study. She called me about an hour or so, uh, an hour ish later, just absolutely hopping, happy, excited, walking and leaping and praising God. And she says, "What did you do?" I told, "All I did was pray. All I did is ask the Lord, and you trusted in the Lord, and the Lord healed you. Complete, utter, utter healing. A complete, full healing in the name of Jesus Christ." Why look ye upon me as though I did this? I did nothing. It's not me. It's him. It's him who gave the perfect soundness. It's him who gave the perfect healing. It's him that did it, not me. I'm a nobody. Don't look at me. Look at him. Don't praise me. Praise him. I'm a nobody. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. That's all I am. I'm just a servant. As are you. We are just servants. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be exalted. He is the majestic one. He is the one that could do, that can do it all. Yeah, it's the name of Jesus Christ. Believe in Him. Believe in His name through the power of His name. Have faith in His name. The name of Jesus Christ is the power. And now, brethren, so look what he says. Look what Peter says. Don't look at us. We didn't do it. Look at Jesus Christ. It was the name of Jesus Christ that healed this lame man. Now look what Peter does. Verse 17. He switches gears. He switches gears right here. Verse 17. He goes right from the whole point, showing him Jesus did this. Now I'm going to tell you about him. Look what Jesus did. Now I'm going to teach you about him. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. See, as I taught Pam the power of Jesus Christ, I showed her the truth of the faith of Jesus Christ. I showed her the power of the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord confirmed the word with signs following. That's what the Lord did. Mark 16, 20. And the Lord confirmed the word of Peter and John with signs following. Why? Why? So Jesus Christ would be magnified. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ would be preached and proliferated. And now, brethren, now, after seeing this mighty healing of the lame man walking, now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Which prophets? Acts 10.43 To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth on him shall receive remission of sins. What prophets? We'll take a look at the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, shall bring forth a son, and thou shall call his name Emmanuel. Jeremiah 31, 22. The Lord will do a new thing in the earth. Behold, a woman shall compass a man. Divine conception. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. In Bethlehem, Eph uh, in Bethlehem Ephrata will be born the one whose ways have been of old, even of everlasting. Isaiah, chapter 53. He'll grow up amongst them as a, as a, a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He'll be rejected of all. He'll be taken from prison and from judgment. He'll make his death with the wicked, his grave with the rich. He'll, he'll bear our iniquities, but his days will be prolonged. He'll be resurrected. All the prophets gave witness. They spoke of this Christ, this Messiah that we put to death for our sins and be resurrected. He'll be born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, called the mighty God. He'll bear our sins. He'll come for our sins. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which shall take away the sin of the world. All the prophets gave witness of Jesus, the Christ. But those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all of his prophets... That Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When you believe in the gospel, you're sealed by the Spirit of God. What is the Spirit of God? The Spirit of Christ. Ephesians 3.17 The Spirit of Christ. Christ will seal the heart of all the believers. Amen, amen. You had faith the size of a mountain when you believed on Jesus Christ. The same faith that you put on Jesus Christ for salvation is the same faith on the rest of the story. On the rest of the teachings, of the doctrines, the rest of the book, same faith. As you believe in Jesus Christ, purely, simply, sincerely, you believe in the rest of it. The Lord is able. He is able to save you. When you make a mistake, just confess it. Whenever you make a mistake, confess it. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 2 John 2.1 If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. <laughs> Amen. Repent ye therefore. Repent ye therefore. Why are you believing in Jesus? For salvation from your sins. So repent of your sins and believe the gospel as Jesus says. Mark 1.15 and he shall send Jesus Christ to you. This same Jesus that healed the lame man. This same Jesus that turned the water to wine. The same Jesus that put his hands upon the face of the blind man and restored his sight. The same Jesus that put his hands upon, upon the, the lepers and healed them. This same Jesus that spoke, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. The same Jesus that fed the thousands, that walked on water, that raised the dead, that healed the sick, that did all the miracles. The same Jesus that died on the cross for your sins. The same Jesus that was buried. The same Jesus that rose again to life. The same Jesus that ascended. The same Jesus will come to you 
when you believe upon him. Tell him you're, you're sorry for your sins. Ask him to save you. Tell him you believe on him and he will save you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Repent that ye therefore be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Hebrews 8, 12, And I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up, um, uh, raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now what does he mean by a prophet? Now Moses talked about the one that will rise up prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. As a prophet, preaching and declaring and telling of future events and foretelling, forth telling as a prophet, but our high priest and king. Prophet, priest, and king in one. God come down telling as a prophet, working like a priest, sovereign as the king. That's what, the, that's what it means there. Of the words telling what will happen and how to, how it will be done, what the Lord says, declaring the words of God as a prophet. And all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. The reason why Jesus came, the reason why the gospel is preached, the reason why he was born, the reason, as was told by the prophets, was for our sins. Because of sin, the fulfillment of the promise of Adam, God said to Adam, God said to Adam, one will come that will stomp the head of the serpent. He'll crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. Who was that? All the prophets since that time spoke of that event, of the crushing of the head of the serpent, the final defeat of Satan. The ultimate victory. Who was God talking about when he told that to Adam and Eve? He was talking about himself. When you look at all the prophecies. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem. Who will be put to death for our sins and be resurrected. Called the mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Messiah, the Christ of Israel is Jesus. According to the holy prophets, it's Jesus. According to all of the servants of God since the beginning of time, the Christ, the Messiah, is Jesus. As a prophet, as our high priest, as the King of kings, the Lamb of God, the Redeemer, the Savior, Jesus Christ, for the salvation of our sins was He born. For the salvation of our sins he was given. Isaiah chapter 53. So if we go to Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This was 750 years before Jesus was this written. He is despised and rejected of men. Was Jesus despised and rejected? Yep. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Was he? Yep. He was bruised for our iniquities. Was Jesus? Yep. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Was he whipped? Yep. All we like sheep have gone astray. Who is the great shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. What did Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Did he die for our sins? Yep. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. When he was being beaten, did he say a word? Nope. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Was Jesus arrested and in prison? Yep. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Was he killed? Yep. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked. Did he die between crucified between two thieves? Yep. And with the rich in his death was he buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb? Yep. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. In him was no sin, he did no sin, he knew no sin. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was God's plan. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. What did John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Well, what was necessary for the forgiveness of sins? The shedding of the blood of a lamb. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. He'll come back to life. Was Jesus resurrected? Yep. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. For the purpose of our sins was he born. Therefore, Will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors, he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This same Jesus prophesied of Jesus standing before the Samaritan woman. She says, we know that when Messiah comes, which is called Christ, he'll teach us all things. And Jesus says, I that speak unto thee am he. And by the sheer mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, he went and preached and taught and healed and helped and provided and showed the great power of God. And this same Jesus was rejected and beaten and tortured. His visage was so marred beyond any man you couldn't recognize him. The, it, you could see his bones from the whipping and the torture. They ripped him open. You could see his bones. My bones were visible. My joints they put out of place. And they took him and nailed him to the cross. They tore his beard out of his face. The crown of thorns they beat into his head. They punched and slapped and beat him. Whipped him and tortured him. And they crucified him. He shed his blood. And he cried out, It is finished. Bowed his head. Gave up the ghost. Was buried for three days. And rose again to life. Jesus says in John 10, 18, I have power to lay down my life and take it up again. No man taketh it from me. I have power. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Believe in me, and, and, you, and, you shall, and you shall never die. All those who believe in me shall never die. He showed he has power to give everlasting life. He has the ability to forgive sins. Go, sin no more. Thy faith has saved thee. Go and sin no more. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Who is this one that doth forgive sins? There's none that can forgive sins but God. Jesus forgave sins. Jesus was worshipped. Jesus claimed the names of God. Jesus proved the power of God. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. This same Jesus we preach. This same Jesus is just as true today as he's always been. 
this same Jesus. His name is just as powerful as it was then as it is now. This same Jesus that healed the, healed the lame man, this same Jesus can heal you. This same Jesus that saved them back then can save you. Saul became Paul. Anyone can be saved. This same Jesus can defeat all the gods of the world. This same Jesus, by faith in his name, by the power of his name, he can help you. Call upon this name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Lord God Jesus Christ. He can save you. He can help you. He said he would. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Repent ye and be converted. Wash your hands in innocency in the blood of the Lamb and the Lord will help you. That's Acts chapter 3. So there you go, folks. So I, I want to just end it on that note. We'll wrap this up. We'll take an intermission. We'll come back in 30 minutes. So I hope that you'll tune in. Um, I'm not going to answer any questions at this time. I, I just want to leave it at that um, at with this for this video. So we'll be back in 30 minutes for another broadcast here on Periscope. And uh, so I hope you'll tune in then. So please uh, set your set your alarm for that. So God bless you, folks. God bless all those who love our Lord God, Jesus Christ. God bless all those who love His Holy Word. Hope to see you again, folks. And as always, if I don't see you again, I'll see you in the sky. God bless. <laughs>